Hello and welcome to this video in which we will use the discrete time Fourier transform to examine the effects of windowing. Uh, windowing is uh, something that you see done quite a bit. Uh, the reason for this is the following. Uh, I've drawn just a sample waveform here, S of n, uh, which is a cosine. And um, in mathematically at least, I can say that this cosine goes forever. Uh, it goes from n is equal to minus infinity up to n is equal to positive infinity. In the real world, however, I can't uh, actually have a cosine that goes forever. And in fact, in most applications where we're doing some sort of processing on a signal, uh, we divide the signal into blocks. So what I've done here is I've taken 12 samples of uh, S of n, and these 12 samples I've, I, I can think of as a block of 12 samples, and I've called this X of n. And the idea that I take just a small chunk, or maybe even a large chunk, but I take a chunk of a, of a signal, this is called windowing. And uh, the nature, or, or the origin of the term, I think, is that you have a window into, oops, a window into uh, part of the signal. Now when we do this windowing, uh, the spectrum or the Fourier transform of X will not be the same as the Fourier transform of our original signal. So um, basically that's what we'll investigate in this video. In order to do this, we will use the multiplication theorem, uh, which um, basically says that if we multiply two signals in the time domain, and uh, we'll get x by multiplying s by a rectangular pulse. So if we multiply these two signals in the time domain, then in the frequency domain we get the um, Fourier transform of the product by convolving the Fourier transforms of the individual signals. So that's basically where we're headed. And um, hopefully uh, this will make sense. So again, the question we're going to ask, and we're going to answer it by computing that, is how s of e to the j omega and x e to the j omega, how do these guys compare? OK, so the first thing we need to do is we need to find s e to the j omega. And we'll, use, we'll do this by using um, the fact that s of n is a periodic signal. It has a period of 12. So you can see s of n has a period of 12. And so its fundamental frequency will be 2 pi over 12. OK. And we can find its uh, Fourier series coefficients as follows. Um, we can write s of n, which again is the cosine of um, 2 pi over 12 n. We can write this as 1 half e to the j 2 pi over 12 n plus e to the minus j 2 pi over 12 n. Uh, these terms here, this is omega 0, and this is omega 0. And so by inspection, uh, as you'll recall from the uh, video that introduces the uh, discrete time Fourier series, we have that C1 is equal to 1 half. Basically, uh, we have here um, a k is equal to 1. Here we have a k is equal to negative 1, so this will be c negative 1 is also equal to 1 half. The 1 halves for both of these come from this 1 half out in front. OK. And all the other c sub k's are 0 OK. And um, we can now uh, find the uh, Fourier transform of S of n 
from these Fourier series coefficients. So we have s of e to the j omega. It turns out that this is equal to the summation k going from minus infinity to infinity, 2 pi c sub k delta omega minus k omega 0. Now this points out that I actually um, I actually lied here when I said that c sub k is equal to 0 for all other k's. Um, these Fourier series coefficients are periodic. So this would be c sub 0 is equal or c sub k is equal to 0 for all other k's such that um, we have a period 12, so we could say minus 6 less than or equal to k less than 6. Okay. Uh, because they're periodic, uh, c13 will be the same as c1, c11 will be the same as c minus 1, and so on. So these guys are periodic. And so what I'm doing here uh, to get the spectrum or the uh, frequency, uh, the Fourier transform of this signal is I take each uh, Fourier series coefficient, multiply it by a delta function that's been shifted by k times omega 0, and multiply it by 2 pi. This is like a normalization factor. Okay, so um, we can write this guy then. Oops, we'll write it in green to stay consistent. Uh, when k is equal to 1, we'll have 1 half, well, we'll have the 2 pi out here, times 1 half times delta of omega minus omega 0. So again, this is a case where k is equal to 1, where k is equal to negative 1, we'll have 2 pi times 1 half times delta omega plus omega 0. And these are all the terms we're going to have for k uh, between minus 6 and 6. And then we'll have plus all the other terms that show up because this is periodic. So we'll have a term here when k is equal to um, 13. We'll have a, uh, a non-zero term when k is 11. We'll have a non-zero term and so on. But I'm not going to talk about these because uh, the fact that we know that this guy is periodic says that if we've got one period worked out, which we have here, then we can figure out what all the other periods are going to look like. And our convolution is a periodic convolution, so I actually need to know this guy for only one period. So I can simplify a little bit uh, the 2 and the 1 half cancel. So I can say that this is pi delta omega minus omega 0 plus delta omega plus omega 0. And then there's all these other terms that show up again because this is periodic. So we have the same thing shifted to the right by uh, 12, 24, and so on, and shifted to the left by 12, 24, and so on. So to sketch what we have here, If we think of this in terms of omega at, and this is 0, oops, that's going to be confusing. Uh, we'll draw it like this. So at omega 0, we'll have this delta function that has an area of pi, and at minus omega 0, we'll have this delta function which has, um, again, an area of pi. Okay, and now um, it turns out that as we, again, because uh, this guy is periodic, we'll have out here centered at 2 pi something that looks like the same thing, and we'll have it out at 4 pi and 6 pi and so on, and out at negative 2 pi, we'll have the same thing. Okay, but again, uh, to do our periodic convolution, we need to know this over only one period. So this is the part of it that we're going to look at.
Okay, so hopefully um, this computing of the spectrum of S makes sense. So the next thing we need to do, let's go back to our discrete time Fourier transform, is we need to figure out how we're going to compute X. Well, X is going to be S times R of N, where R of N is a rectangular pulse of duration n samples. And the way I've drawn it here, uh, since I get 12 samples, n is 12. And uh, for this video, uh, we'll use n as 12 or multiples of 12, but it doesn't really have to be that way. Okay, so we have, um, and again the idea is that this rectangular pulse will be 1 between 0 and 11 and 0 everywhere else. When I take that pulse and multiply it by the cosine, I get this, in the case where n is equal to 12, I get just a single period of the cosine. Okay, so if I have multiplication in the time domain, then um, that multiplication in the time domain becomes a convolution in the frequency domain. So we have x of e to the j omega. This is 1 over 2 pi. This is a normalization constant that shows up in a lot of different situations r e to the j omega convolved with s e to the j omega, where this is the Fourier transform of r of n, and this is the Fourier transform of s of n. And again, because uh, r, my Fourier transforms are periodic, this is a periodic convolution. Okay. From a previous video, we know that r of e to the j omega is equal to e to the minus j omega n minus 1 over 2 sine of omega n over 2 divided by sine of omega over 2. Okay, so we basically now have this guy. We all, we've computed S, so if we look at plots of these guys, they look like this. So this is uh, the Fourier transform of my rectangular uh, pulse, or this is actually the magnitude of the Fourier transform of my rectangular pulse. This is the Fourier transform of my cosine, and you can see again that it is uh, just a delta function at omega 0, which in this case is uh, 2 pi over 12 or pi over 6. Okay, so the next thing we need to do then is actually work out what this convolution will be. And I'm going to do this by um, breaking s into uh, pi delta omega minus omega 0 plus pi delta omega plus omega 0. And the reason for doing this is the following. It's easy to come up or to do this convolution and once we understand, or I'm sorry, it's easy to do the convolution of R with this delta function and once we understand that it's easy to do the convolution of R with S. So 1 over 2 pi R e to the j omega convolved with pi delta omega minus omega zero. So we're convolving now with this guy. Um, I can cancel out a pi here and a pi here. So I'm left with one half. The integral over some interval of length two pi r e to the j omega whoops, I don't want omega here, I want like a placeholder, a dummy variable of integration. So I'll call this dummy variable of integration alpha for lack of something better. Um, delta of omega minus omega zero minus alpha, d alpha. Okay, and um, basically I just choose this, uh, the interval that I integrate over so it includes omega minus omega zero. 
And anytime you integrate something with respect to a delta function, it basically just takes the something and shifts it to this part of the argument of the delta function. Okay, so this is one half r e to the minus j omega minus omega zero. So this is actually a very useful result. The idea that if I take a a function and convolve it with the shifted delta function, it just shifts the original function. So similarly, when I convolve with this delta function, I just um, shift r in the opposite direction. So what we end up with then is that x e to the j omega will be one half r e to the minus j omega minus omega zero plus one half r e to the minus j omega plus omega zero. Okay. And so that's basically the result we wanted. Uh, let's look at a plot of this x. And it looks like this. Um, this point here is omega or minus omega zero. This is omega zero. So you can see that it's taken my two delta functions, which I had for s of e to the j omega, and it's um, kind of spread them out, and I've got all these bumps and stuff out here. Uh, this is what rectangular windowing does, is it spreads out the peak, and it adds these things which we call side lobes. Uh, one thing I can do is if I take a longer window, which I did here, you'll notice that my peaks get much sharper, and my side lobes are relatively smaller than the peaks, but I still have the side lobes. Okay. And so what people do in real life is they choose uh, different functions to do the windowing. So instead of a rectangular pulse, they might use a triangular pulse or a raised cosine pulse. There's actually a whole bunch of different windows that give you different uh, effects in the frequency domain. Um, actually, uh, uh, looking at those windows is probably beyond the scope of this video since I'm already way over time. So. Uh, the primary purpose of this video was to demonstrate the multiplication property of the discrete time Fourier transform and use that multiplication property to examine what happens when you window a signal. So hopefully you found this useful. Thanks for watching.